If it was a crime to tell other people about Jesus, would you be guilty? Would there be enough evidence to convict you? That theoretical question has been asked many times in the Western Church. It's even been the subject of popular songs. But when John Short found himself detained by officials in North Korea, the question was very real. He looks back and remembers what his interrogators said. You committed the crime of carrying Bible literature into China. And I said, yes, I, uh, I admit this is a crime against their law. Your second crime is that you want more and more North Koreans to believe in Jesus. I said, yes, I'm guilty. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help right now on The Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. Welcome again to The Voice of the Martyrs Radio. My name is Todd Nettleton. Thank you for being with us this week. You know, one of the incredible blessings of working on my book over the last two years has been going back and reading transcripts of interviews that I've done with persecuted Christians during the last 23 years. And in the case of some of those interviews that we've aired here on Voice of the Martyrs Radio, actually going back and re-listening to the interview itself. In 2015, I went to Hong Kong to interview John Short, the Australian man who had been detained the year before inside North Korea. You know, it's fascinating to think about all of the changes that have happened in Hong Kong since that trip, as China has increased its control and broken the promise of continued freedoms for the people in the former British colony of Hong Kong. We aired my interview with Mr. Short in 2016, and so many were blessed by his calm faithfulness and courage, as well as by the powerful bond between John and his wife Karen and how God carried both of them through the time of his detention in North Korea. But I know that we have added thousands of listeners and hundreds of radio stations since that interview aired, people who didn't hear the amazing testimony of John Short. This week and next week, we're going to remedy that and share again one of the powerful interviews that we've had here on VOM Radio. And if you're a longtime listener and you heard this back in 2016, I think you're going to be inspired and encouraged again by John and Karen and their story. We didn't conduct this interview in a studio, and you'll notice that right away in the sound quality of the recording. But the lack of production value is more than made up for by the great testimony of God's faithfulness, faithfulness that sustains and supports even those in the custody of the so-called hermit kingdom of North Korea. I know, John, that on this time when you were detained in North Korea, this was your second visit, so you'd been there once before. What did you do on that first visit, and what was kind of the purpose of you going to North Korea? On the first occasion, we traveled in with 20 others, all Chinese speakers, because we had produced into Korean, uh, does it matter what I believe? And we were anxious to carry it in and to see the possibilities of where we could leave it and where we could uh, distribute am among the North Koreans. Of course, through the day, we were minded continually and that if on any occasion we drew near to locals, we were immediately uh, shunted away from personal contact. And so then you went back. Talk about the morning when you went to the Buddhist temple, the morning eventually that you would be questioned and then subsequently detained. What, what happened that led up to that? We were taken on a, a car trip to the top of a mountain, and on this mountain top is a Buddhist temple. So we arrived at the Buddhist temple to the dismay of our minders. Someone had broken in to the temple, 
had gone in and ransacked the cupboards, but had also turned the Buddha from his pedestal down onto, onto its face. So this was a moment of great embarrassment, but I still offered a donation for repair of the door to the keeper. But the minders, uh, our minders felt that this was not appropriate, and so we were shunted away from there. I immediately, with my helper, my Chinese helper, separated myself from them and went down the side of the hill distributing my Bible tracts, leaving them where I could. Subsequently, these were discovered. That evening, they came to the hotel to investigate us. What kind of things were they asking? What, what, was, what were they bothered about? So the, the largest annoyance was that I had carried in this literature, firstly, which I freely admitted, was a crime against their law, but not a sin against my God, for it is my life work. As a Christian, as, as we all well know, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence for a conviction? We believe that this is what we should do. So they that evening visited the room uh, and said to myself and to my China co-worker, why did you do this? How did you do this? Where did you get the literature? I said, I printed it myself. Here is a copy. And thankfully, I had a copy in English. I had one in Chinese on me. And they could see that it was not only translated into, into Korean, it was in these multi-languages. Then their problem was, who translated it for you? Who is this Korean that has enabled you to have your written statement of what you believe presented into the Korean language? If I would divulge my contact, my friend, a Korean in Hong Kong, a residential situation, if I were prepared to divulge the name of this Korean, there would be no problem. I would be let go. But they also gave me a warning that if the name was not revealed, we would not be released next day. So I decided that I could release the name of the the dear brother who had helped me because I did not know his full Korean name. I only knew him as Paul Beck. And uh, this troubled them, and yet it was enough to give his assurance that there is no problem, you will be able to leave tomorrow morning, uh, seven o'clock, uh, you check out of the hotel, and nine o'clock is the one flight out of, out of Pyongyang. And so then the next morning, you pack your bag, you're ready to go, and then what happens? We were packed, ready to go, seated in the, the, the car down below at the uh, hotel door, and then suddenly the uh, public security descended upon us and said, you cannot leave. So we were taken inside, and you must realize that on entrance into Pyongyang, your passport and your telephones are taken away. They still had not given the passport for us to carry to the airport. Now, you have been involved in gospel work and in carrying literature into closed countries for a long time, <laughs> 50 years. At some point along the way, you've had to make peace with the idea that things could go south on one of these trips. Talk about when you did that, how you prepared yourself mentally and spiritually. How did that all come into play in your mind? Upon release from 21 years and nine months imprisonment in the north of China, in Heilongjiang, my own personal hero, Brother Alan Yoon, encouraged us to accept the three essential principles should we be called to suffer persecution for Christ. And that is, number one, do not fear them. You belong to Christ. God is on the throne. Respect God. Fear God. Number two, do not believe them. You know that the basis of the unbelieving communist is they do not believe God. So they believed a lie. You don't believe any entreaty, any promise that they make to you. Do not fear them. Do not believe them. And finally, do not think that by receiving anything from them, you're going to escape. You don't want anything from them. All that you'll ever need, 
will come from the hand of your God and your Father. So prepare yourself in this way. Amazingly, when you're detained, when you're imprisoned, you're very conscious that prayer is all around you. We, we cannot see the angelic help, but you are certainly being uh, protected and uh, supported by prayer and angelic present with you. And the scripture in Hebrews remained with me daily. That is that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Therefore, there is no need to fear what man will do to you. How did their questioning progress over the time that you were there? I was taken from the initial hotel that we stayed in, from the first interview to another locality. For the system in North Korea is that the hotels are totally run by the government. In those hotels, they also have, in the back sections of them, they have uh, detention areas. Immediately, I was put under 24-7 guards. Two guards were with me every moment of the day. The shifts would change at the most awkward hours, always at two in the morning. Food was offered to me, which I ate for the first three days. Hours in the morning, three, four hours, investigation in the morning, and again uh, after lunch, another three or four hours in the, in the afternoon. Thankfully, nothing at night. The investigations were always conducted by the same gentleman. He was simply called the investigator. I was tutored how to stand and to bow to him on his entrance into the room, which of course, as Christians, we know we should show full deference to those that are in authority. The initial interviews were very harsh, but then his appointed interpreter was inadequate, and so they then appointed a second interpreter who was uh, who had studied in America and was quite uh, quite excellent at at his work. One particularly odious and difficult issue was in a previous statement I had declared and divulged that at the age of 24 I had boarded a ship and come to the only open port on the edge of China, Hong Kong, and that I'd been there for all those years uh, and that is my life's work, uh, witnessing for Christ in, in China. I felt of God called to this ministry. 24 years of age I came. So I was given a sheet of paper that I should declare and make a statement for every year, for 24 years, what had I done, where was I for each of those years. Now, can you divulge what you did every year for the first 20 odd years of your life? It was extremely uh, difficult because one knows one must not lie to a communist because one lie will unravel the whole situation. So it was a very painful exercise. So they, at least in that particular session, they were more interested in your early life in Australia than they were in what you do in Hong Kong, in, which is gospel work into restricted nations. And I could see no rhyme nor reason for this until I discovered that their agents in, Amer in uh, Australia checked on whether the address I had given my son resident in my home city, whether that was true. So they then would check on all that I had said, was it the truth, these details of my life, that normally we would think, who would know what I do in one of the smaller cities of Australia, South Australia, Adelaide? So you were 73 at the time. They're going back almost 50 years and checking on, I, I, you know, I think that's mind-boggling to us that the reach of the North Koreans, the fact that they had somebody there to go to your son's house and ask is, you know, are you John Short's son? Do you live here? What's going on? Talk a little bit about how they then reported back to you. Yeah, we checked and, and you were telling the truth. So I was quite astounded that having divulged to them that our ministry is supported by donations. We do not merchandise in 
the literature that has been freely prepared, sponsored by others for China, for Burma, for Vietnam, for, for Korea. I said to them that if you were to visit one of our warehouses, our major warehouse in, uh, in the new territories of Hong Kong, you'd walk in the door and you would see a box that says donation, free will offering to support the literature ministry. The very next day, they said to me, we have investigated your statement and you've told the truth. So within 24 hours, they had somebody in your office in Hong Kong looking at your donation box. I discovered when my wife came to fetch me eventually from Beijing, she remembered that particular day previously, a Korean-American lady working for South China Morning Post had come in very intrusively and had asked a, a lot of questions, but had been shown that we uh, do not have headquarters in America, headquarters in Australia, headquarters in Germany, but that we are dependent upon these donations only. In the course of these questions, was there threats? Was there promises? Was there if you know if you'll tell us the truth we'll let you go or was it hey you're going to be here for years we can lock you away and nobody will ever hear from you again one request i had made of them only one may i make a phone call to my wife to tell her that i am well this was denied me this was used as mr short if you'll cooperate you will be able to join your wife i'm sure that you want to see your wife again. And this was repeated again and again. That eventually I felt the need to say to them, I won't ask it again, because my wife knows that I love her. I know that she loves me. And if I never see her again, I'm still quite content with that. That seemed to annoy them even further. When I realized they were denying any link to my loved ones outside. I was totally at their mercy. The Lord then revealed to me the one avenue left to me was that I decide to fast. Fasting is not a problem to us. My wife and I practice it uh, throughout the year. At uh, any point of crisis, we believe that give ourselves to prayer and to fasting. So. From the occasion that they denied me any link, I decided that I no longer had an appetite for food. This subsequent action unnerved them to me. I then received probably the best medical attention that foreigners were receiving. Doctors attended, nurses attended me. As each day went by, three days, five days, seven days, 10 days, others would come and asked the minders, could they come and see the strange foreigner who has fasted for so many days and has not fainted? It seems like they were worried about your health because they didn't want anything to go wrong with you because then they'd really have a problem. So how did they, how did they respond to that? What did they say? Different relays of messages were passed on to me, and that was that if I will cooperate with this, if I will tell more of what I feel of the, um, the, the current political situation uh, in North Korea, on each occasion I said to them, I have no political interest. I'm interested in the gospel. The issue of uh, not eating uh, really troubled them because they found that I had some power that they did not have over me. One of the blessings of this was that they allowed you to keep your Bible. Yes. Uh, talk a little bit about what that meant to you and, and how your times in God's Word were different being detained than maybe they are on a normal day. Yeah. On each occasion of entry into North Korea, I make a point of putting my Bible on the top, my personal Bible on the top of my possessions before each entrance, uh, our possessions are investigated. 
the North Korean says, what's that? And I say, that's a Bible. That's my Bible. You can't take that into North Korea. I say, well, then, if I can't take that in, I don't go in. Then you'll have to cancel my, my visit because I'm a Christian. I read my Bible every day. I need this with me because then they'll call in others and they have a little debate about it. And then they say, but we shouldn't let you carry it. I said, well, I, I need it. I have to have it. Then they will say, now, it will be recorded. You must bring this out again. I said, well, it's an English Bible. I don't think Koreans would in, enjoy it as much as I do. It's my Bible. I give you my word. I will bring it out again. For that reason, by taking that step, I was then able to keep it in my possession, even when detained for the entire time. What was your schedule like with the Bible? I mean, you had interrogations morning and afternoon. What were you doing the rest of the day to kind of feed yourself spiritually going through this time? Yes, thankfully, uh, all those occasions where I wanted to have more time to read the Word of God were suddenly granted to me. I could read uh, Romans and John's Gospel and entire books of the Word of God, just read and read and read for my life, for my spiritual life. Were there any passages that uh, maybe took on a new meaning while you're being detained? Yes, I must admit that the reading through the Psalms, just reading them right through, tremendous comfort in the reading of the, the tribulation Psalms. It's interesting that you say that because I'm, my understanding is Sabina Wormbrand had basically memorized the book of Psalms in, in the course of her life and would say the same thing when she was in prison. The Psalms were what really fed her spirit. On one occasion, the, uh, the second interpreter said to me, you do realize, don't you, that your crime is punishable with a minimum of three years. I said, well, I've counted up and I'm now 70, and that will mean, well, I'll be nearly 80 by the time I come out. Oh, that's, that's bearable. Um, so he told me that they have come to the conclusion that you have three crimes. Uh, one is you committed the crime of carrying Bible literature into China. And I said, yes, I, I admit this is a crime against their law. Number two, that your second crime is that you want more and more North Koreans to believe in Jesus. I said, yes, guilty. Third crime, you chose to give out those uh, Bible tracts near a Buddhist temple, or, no, in a Buddhist temple, which I always told them was not in, was outside. But you chose to do it, worst of all, on the birthday of the previous Kim, Kim Il-jong. And you virtually slashed him in the, in the face. You smacked his face to do, and it was a, a political uh, bash at, at our leader. And I said, not guilty. I would not, I would not acknowledge that this had been done on his birthday with, with intent to insult. There was no political motive at all. Did you know it, uh, it, that it even was his birthday, or was that news to you? It was news to me, but we did know that festivities were being carried on. But to me, uh, the birthday of Kim Il-sung was irrelevant to me. What were the others? You talked about Alan Yoon, but I know you've met many of the great saints of the Chinese church. Were there other stories of theirs that you thought about during your time in North Korea that, that kind of encouraged you and, and fed you? Yes, um, I often thought of uh, not only those that have been arrested for their faith, not only my particular hero, Alan Yoon, but uh, Wong Ming Dao, Samuel Lamb in the South, others who've suffered, whether Bonhoeffer in Germany or the VOM, Richard Wormbrand. Richard Wormbrand. Th thought of all of these, but they in their turn not only were in prison, not only suffered, but were tortured. And these things strengthen your heart and prepare you for whatever lies ahead. We're going to break into John Short's amazing testimony right there for this week. But you'll definitely want to hear the rest of the story 
including how he was eventually released and allowed to leave North Korea. So be sure that you're back with us next week, right here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network.